everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are talking to Lorraine Carey, and she is going to be talking about her book, Lady Sitting, My Year with Nana at the End of Her Century. And we're going to be talking about a bunch of different topics to uh, match Lorraine's life. We're going to be talking about her um, creative expression um, with and her creative process as she has dived into several different ways of um, expressing herself with her um, with her experience with her grandma. We're also going to talk about um, what's happening right now um, with the George Floyd um, and uh, Derek Chauvin now actually being persecuted. Um, and then uh, we're prosecuted. also prosecuted. What did I say? Persecuted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, prosecuted. <laughs> and then we're going to be um, talking about um, some other aspects of your um, of your story. So um, I want to start first talk, start off with um, Derek Chauvin and um, what your experience was. I was actually watching, just uh, kept on refreshing, like waiting for the verdict mm -hmm. to come. What was your experience like? My experience was that I was driving. Wow. I was doing errands. I had just taken my mother to drop off her IRS forms. Um, and so that was a kind of lady sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, mom wasn't quite able to remember the place until we got there and then she did. And so all of my attention was on her and her experience. Mm. And she wanted to see this man who has done her taxes for a gazillion years. And his sign on the door said, because of COVID just drops through the slot. Oh. And yes, right. Mm. And so then we went to get a bite in the car. And so it was all of that stuff. It was a lady sitting time. Mm -hmm. And when I dropped her off, I hit the radio and I heard it should be coming on in 15 minutes. So then I'm listening as I'm driving away. I'm also getting texts from my cousins, mm. but I'm saying, oh, you're driving, don't. And, and I started thinking about all the, the ripples from this. and. Uh, then I stopped at FedEx and mailed things to my daughters and listen. And while I was there at the FedEx, my cousin sent me the text. And I said to the young woman, young black woman is doing it. I said, I told her what had happened. And she said, oh, that's why they're shouting in the back. Mm. So we, it was that. And then I drove by my cousins. Um, my cousin whose partner is, um, is in the very final stages of a, of a god awful cancer. Oh, and she's sorry. in the house, she's with him, she's staying. And I just drove by and sent her a text that come to the door. Mm. Uh, and she just came out and hugged me. Mm. Yeah. How does it feel now? Does it feel any different? You know, just when you said that, it's the first time that I, I, I feel like I need to fight off uh, crying. Yeah. I was even crying when I heard you saying that. It's just so, um, I don't know. I don't know what the feeling would be that I would describe, but how would you, is it like hope? Is it? relief or what would you say is the emotion that you feel when you tune into it? I think there's so many. I think it's really complicated. Uh, relief is certainly part of it. Yeah. Relief because over and over and over again, we've been so disappointed and traumatized and hurt so much. So right now when I'm working, I'm doing a writing residency in the gallery, little row house gallery space called Art Sanctuary. It's a it's an organization I founded a long time ago. Now it's run by the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Because the gallery has been closed, I said, "Hey, can I use it?" Like, I know it's kind of boring to watch a 
lady to sit there and write, but it's less <laughs> boring than having the shades pulled, right? <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the big wall there is a mural of the couple who used to run that place, mm. G. Edward Dickerson and Addie Dickerson. This is the place where my grandmother worked. This mm. is the building that they bought right? So in Lady Sitting, when I talk about the, the place where she was a trustee, it's this building. Mm. And G. Edward Dickerson was one of four graduates from the law, Black graduates from Temple Law School in the 1920-something. Mm. Mm. He was the first African-American lawyer to bring a police officer to court um, for murdering a black person in Philadelphia, a white mm. police officer. Mm. Of course, it never got any farther. But for, for me to get, go in that building every day, knowing he was there mm. and um, knowing that when I was eight years old, I watched on our black and white television as the Voting Rights Act was passed, knowing that I listened in my second grade classroom as John F. Kennedy was assassinated after, and Malcolm X and Martin King and Rob, all those assassinations. So I thought that the grownups had lost their minds. Mm. I remember seeing Fannie Lou Hamer and her cut off because Lincoln, Lin, Lyndon Johnson did a press conference for nothing, mm. just so that that woman from Mississippi couldn't tell her story. Like, I am old enough to be this bridge from when black people couldn't vote. Mm. And when, when it was, they, you know, I don't remember the Emmett Till, but like from that to Floyd, mm. my whole life. And then spending a lot of lady sitting, researching the things that my grandmother wouldn't tell me because they didn't. They just sort of didn't, right? About, about all the death, all the death that is necessary. This is an amazing man named Jan Carew was a Jamaican American scholar who said that what, what happened um, and continues to happen to African-Americans, he calls it total war, total war in his Jamaican accent. He says total war, it's legal, it is cultural and it is violent. Mm. The legal has to be enforced with the violence. Mm. So mm. that's been my whole life. Mm. So I hear this one verdict and yes, I'm relieved. I'm relieved that we can't, that we don't have it in our face again that says, as we've been saying these last few years, with impunity, we will kill you with impunity. Mm. We're gonna do it so the whole world can watch. Mm. And what the hell are you gonna do? Nothing. Like that, and for me, that's a, that's a structural language. That's language that comes off the stones mm -hmm. of the building. that look so beautiful, but in fact say, this is the power that will keep you vulnerable. Mm. So that's how you just wanted to start off the interview, how huh? you just want to get me all crazy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you seem too measured before, too professorial. Let's get real here. Well, I, I think that it's really, um, you know, so if we, if we take even, you know, I'm thinking about your grandma, right, who didn't, when you think about the hardship, my, my mom, who um, everything, she moved, my mom and dad moved several different times from communist China, because each time they moved, the communists would come and take away their home, take away their possessions, everything. So they actually several times moved from China. Mm -hmm my dad came over on a boat my mom flew over but they both and actually my dad 
came over on boat and went to University of Pennsylvania oh. <laughs> for his grad school degree. Oh. Yeah. So, and my mom went to Michigan, but it's, you know, they don't like talking about their stories. My dad loved telling his stories. So I finally got, I, and I would get a sense, you know, when you're younger, you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever your story, stop telling me stories. Now I wish he died very early. So I don't, I've never have a sense of his stories. And so here you have your grandma who can you know, tell you the sense of the stories across different generations. Um, and you said that you didn't, she, she, you were saying that she couldn't really tell you what, 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 what did you learn about her ability to even tell the stories and what did you find out about kind of the whole experience that she, like, how did you get, do the research for telling that aspect of her story? I'll tell you what, the, the person, uh, when I was a kid, I think this is sort of what shows you that you're meant to be a writer, but who knew? Yeah. Um, was that I was hungry for the stories. I never said whatever. Mm. I stayed upstairs with my great grandfather from Barbados. Mm. The first memoir I wrote, which was about going to boarding school, sort of on scholarship in New England, right in the center, if you open the book up in the center, there are his, um, his folk stories that he told me. Amazing, wonderful folk tales about a woman who um, woman who left out of the window every night and left her skin draped on the windowsill mm. and fly out in the night. And then her husband says to the old lady at the village, how can I keep my wife here in bed where she should be? And the old woman says, put, put salt on the inside of her skin. And when she slips back in, it'll it'll do something. So she comes back in and she screams when she tries to get in because it burns her and she says, skin, skin, you no know me, skin, no, no. Me. So, so, so he told me all these stories. I loved them mm. and I held them even though many of the stories were, um, were stories that um, could have oppressed me. Mm. I took them as they were told. So I didn't take that story as you should stay in bed with your husband. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do nothing else. Right. I took that story as you go out. You can fly. <laughs> you can fly. <laughs> your dreams. You can fly. And you better take your skin and don't let nobody salt your skin. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> watch the salt next time when you fly. Right, right. Or pick a new man or something. Like <laughs> figure something out, baby, but go ahead and fly. <laughs> so I love those stories. My grandmother was what my, my sister is very funny. My sister says, she says, you know, Nana was a material girl. Well, in fact, Nana wanted the, the world um, sort of, um, mm, she wanted the world nigger proof. She wanted a world where nobody could make her, um, nobody could insult her, nobody could hurt her mm. in the ways that black people have been. Now she, did, she, she didn't want to pass, she could have passed, and one of her sisters did pass for white, um, but she did not. So, so she lived in this very careful little box mm. just to make sure that nobody could. What she didn't do, what some folks do, which is get like crazy education. She didn't. Uh, she didn't have the. Um, she was afraid because her father, who also looked white, had been, uh, and I learned about this, really I learned a lot from a woman who is a way distant, distant, distant cousin named Lisa mm. Henderson, mm -hmm. who has an amazing website called Scuff Along. Mm. I don't know why she calls it that, but it's Scuff Along. Okay. And in it, are news clippings, all these things about free people of color in North Carolina before mm. the Civil War. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and that get, and then from there, I would go right to the newspaper or go. Um, my grandmother's grandfather, Napoleon, was called in front of the Senate to testify as to why Black people were leaving the South <laughs> in 18, like 68. Like, <laughs> why would y'all want to leave? <laughs> Why y'all want to leave it so nice there? So good. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, ridiculous. it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It is laughable. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So he testified and she had the congressional record. I think it was to the Senate. I think it was to the Senate. And if it's the Congress, I'm sorry. It is in the book. And I have it correctly in the book, but she um, she had that record so that I could mm. check it and see the man who was was questioning him had been in the Confederate Army and then in jail and then back out and then governor of the state and then in the Senate. That was the white path. Mm. The free person of color path was this ancestor of mine, Napoleon Hagens, who amassed 500 acres of land. And the guy asked him, the the Senator uh, Zebulon or something, asked him, how did you get your land? And you can almost hear the sneer in Napoleon's voice when you read the words, I work for it. Mm. Ask me how I get my land. I work for it. I earned this is it. your grandfather. This Napoleon. This is my grandmother's grandfather. Your grandmother's grandfather. Wow. So it's my great great grandfather. Wow. Wow. And then his son, his son worked really hard with the Republican Party what they called the fusion party. And the fusion party was working to get black working people, black people, free people of color, black people with a little bit of money and a little bit more money and white people who had not been slave owners, who did not have any sort of financial interests in slave owning or in the, the, the lost cause myth-making foolishness and was a fusion party. It wow. was that party that um, elected a biracial city council in Wilmington, North Carolina. Wow. And it was there that the United States had its only successful coup. Wow. Their white citizens went in killed people, burned down the black press, captured people who were in the state house. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm. Going into the state house, taking the, not the state house, the city council, taking them out, the town council, mm. um, threatening them with death, and then putting themselves in power. Wow. Now the question is, did the United States, did the feds come in and say, Oh, hell no. These Americans elected those people back up. I'm sorry you killed 60 people. I'm sorry you burned down the newspaper. But no, we don't do that in the United States. Did they say that? No. Wow. All right. I'm, oh. I'm, I, I actually want to go to the next segment where I actually want to talk about um, that there's so many themes here to um, dive into. But I think what I'm feeling is the theme of power power um i think that that's um and i mean because here you have this rich story of your of power and the different variations of power whether it was your grandmother who had this like inner power i don't care what anyone is going to say around me i know i'm good and i'm right and i'm good exactly how i am right and then i don't know if that's how your grandma but that's what i got the the gist mm-hmm. of it and then your 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 great your your grand the great great grandfather yeah who's like i worked for this i like you know and then to the 
sad accumulation of that just the coup and and the and regardless the of what you're going to do you still don't have power right i mean you don't even when you go through all the legitimate means there's a sense that you could you've gained power you could lose it in the next generation i mean it's very interesting okay so we're going to talk next about power <laughs> Uh, we've been talking to Lauren Carey about her book, um, Lady Sitting, My Year with Nana and the End of Her Century, and um, her st historical uh, sense about what's happening right now. Thank you so much. Thank you.